Welcome to this lecture for Research Methods. We'll be talking today about correlational designs. So we'll talk about what correlational research is, we'll talk about looking at correlations between quantitative variables, and then also uh, looking at them between qualitative or nominal variables. We'll talk about correlational designs that, that look at group differences, we'll talk about interpreting the results of correlational studies, and then uh, end up with um, some guidelines on when to use correlational designs. All right, so what is it? Well, it's when you're collecting data on at least two variables to determine if there's some relationship or association between them, right? So again, if you're just collecting on data to see, hey, how much is something happening, that's just descriptive research. Now, now if you collect data on some variables and you look at relations between them, it's moved on to uh, potentially at least correlational research. So what you're looking for is, does knowing the value of one variable, if you're above or below the mean, high or low on this variable, does it tell you something? Does it predict something about where somebody would be in terms of the value of another variable? Also, you know, above and below the mean. Um, what it's not, it's not experimental. It's not experimental because uh, no variable is manipulated, right? So you don't have an independent variable. So we use some different terms here. We use predictor variable, criterion variable, instead of talking about the independent and dependent variable when we're talking about correlational studies. So the language is a little different because we're not manipulating an IV. Uh, and even if we are looking at groups, which we sometimes do in correlational research, we don't typically assign people to groups, right? So you don't have power to assign group membership based on, you know, level of the independent variable. Okay, so looking at uh, the correlation between two quantitative variables. Typically, you start by looking at the scatter plot, right, which allows for a visual examination of the pattern of association. So here's an example scatter plot, right, where you've got um, your predictor variable along the horizontal or x-axis and your criterion outcome variable along the, the vertical y-axis, right. So every data point on this scatter plot represents one person, right, and it represents, okay, where are they on, you know, variable A and variable B, that kind of intersection of those two variables. And the degree to which there's some sort of uh, linear association between the two variables, you can kind of see that here in this scatter plot. And uh, in fact, you've got a line uh, superimposed on here, which we talk about being the regression line, right? So for every scatter plot, for every set of data, for two variables, there is some line that best fits the data. Best fits in terms of, okay, if you try to think of um, every point is distant from some line, what line can be drawn such that on average you have the smallest difference, distance of points from that line? And this is what this regression line is, right? It's kind of a best fit model, which we'll talk more about when we get later on to uh, regression, because all regression is is the equation for that line. Uh, I think it's correlation. Uh, there's a line there, but you don't know what it is. But it's just kind of a theoretical model. And we're looking at uh, a correlation coefficient being calculated to, to estimate this kind of uh, relationship between two quantitative variables. And the most commonly used one is the Pearson correlation coefficient, sometimes called a Pearson, Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. And so it's R. And it ranges in value from negative uh, 1 all the way up to 1 and all points in between, right? So it can't be bigger than positive 1 or smaller, more negative than, than negative 1. So what this correlation coefficient tells you, two things. It tells you the direction of the relationship, right? So if it's a positive relationship, like the one we saw earlier, when you have values that are, um, you know, above the mean on one variable, well, then they tend to be above the mean on the other. And if they're below the mean on one variable, they tend to be below the mean on the other. So we talked about things co-varying in the same direction, right? So higher scores on one are associated with higher scores on the other. And lower scores on one are associated with lower scores on the other, right? So positive doesn't necessarily mean up and up, and it can also mean down and down, decrease and decrease. So just they, they co-vary together, they move in the same direction. Or you can have a negative relationship, right? So this is a scatter plot looking at uh, two negatively correlated uh, variables. So in this instance, lower scores on one are associated with higher scores on the other. And higher scores on that one are associated with lower scores 
on the other, right? So they're inversely related. So as you increase on one, you decrease on the other. Or as you decrease on one, you increase on the, on the other. So they co-vary in opposite directions. So, and you get that from the sign, right? So if it's a positive sign, which we, you don't typically see a plus by the number when people report a correlation coefficient, if they have, you know, R equals 0 0.2, well, that's plus 0.2, the positive is assumed. If it's negative, there will be a negative sign there telling you that it's a the directional relationship is, is negative, is inverse. That correlation coefficient also tells you the strength of the relationship. So for this, you're looking at the absolute value of R. Right, so we said, you know, which is a stronger correlation, R of 0.9 or R of negative 0.9? Uh, those are equally strong, right? They're equally distant from zero. So the further you are from zero, the stronger the correlation. And it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, it's just how far is it from zero. Uh, so the thing about that kind of scatter plot, that value of R is going to be greater the closer those dots are to some kind of theoretical... Uh, line, that line of regression, but not if the line is perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical, right? Because if the line is perfectly horizontal, what does that mean? It means that, okay, well, along the x-axis, no matter, uh, you can have all kinds of different scores, but everybody's scoring the same thing on the y-axis, right? That'll give you that horizontal line. A vertical line says, okay, well, on our predictor variable, everybody scored a 10. They all scored the same thing, but they got different values on the outcome variable. So both of those would be zero correlations, right? So if it's perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertical, that's zero correlation. And then also if it's kind of amorphous blob, that may be closer to a zero correlation. In terms of trying to figure out um, the strength of relationship, in addition to looking at uh, just the absolute value of the size of R, you can also calculate um, the coefficient of determination, and that should be a, a lowercase r squared here. Uh, we'll see the uppercase r squared um, elsewhere, uh, which I'll go back and edit that. Uh, but the coefficient of determination, again, you just take whatever the value of R is and you square it. And that tells you the percentage of variability in one variable that's accounted for by variability in the other variable. Or another thing about it is the percentage of shared variability. So if two things have a correlation of 0.7, then R squared is 0.49, right? 0.7 times 0.7. That means that, okay, with my predictive variable, I can account for 49% or about half of the variability in the other variable. I can explain variability based on what, how you scored on this one. Okay, so the higher R is, obviously the higher R squared is. If you have a perfect correlation, either one or negative or one, you have a, also have a R squared of one, meaning you can explain all the variability. So if I know the score on the predictor, I can tell you uh, exactly uh, what score you're going to have on criterion if I've got a, a R squared of 1. R squared less than that, okay, I can tell you eh, plus or minus this much with some degree of accuracy. How accurate you're going to be depends on how big that R is and how big that, that R squared is. Um, so here's a scatter plot of a probably close to a zero order correlation, right? So some people that scored uh, below the mean on the predictive variable along the x-axis, um, they scored fairly low on the criterion, but some scored high. They scored both high and low. Okay, well, as I go across from low to high along the x-axis, um, okay, still on the other variable, the outcome, some scoring high, some scoring low. So there's no consistent relationship as I move along one axis to what's happening on the other axis. So just, and there's uh, a zero correlation, or at least a weak correlation, very right? not a strong relationship, a weak relationship. And uh, one reason we see um, weak relationships, and not necessarily zero uh, <clears throat> or equal zero relationships, but let's say you have a, a variable, two variables you're looking at, and you think, oh, I, these things are definitely related, and you find out, you know, oh yeah, R is equal to uh, 0.3, and it's statistically significant, I'm like, yeah. Wow, but if I think about it, R of 0.3, that means R squared is 0 0.09. I'm only explaining 9% of the variability. Well, what's all the other variability being caused by? Well, it's being caused by extraneous variables. And that's to be expected in the behavioral sciences, right? If I'm looking at, okay, uh, can I predict um, how, many, uh, how many times you go out in a week based on how depressed you are? 
yeah, I can find a correlation there. It won't be a, a correlation above 0.5, I, I guarantee you. It'll be fairly small, right? Like, but aren't those related? Yeah, they're related, but there's other things that are gonna influence how much you go out, right? Because there may be people that aren't depressed at all, but they're never gonna go out because they're broke, right? Or because they're um, um, working 60 hours a week, or because they have kids. Well, there's all kinds of reasons, other things that are gonna influence this outcome variable. And even if something is related, the correlation between your variable and that outcome is never going to be one. And it's probably going to be pretty low in most instances, unless you kind of restrict your, your, uh, your sample to a small group of people that are all um, very similar to each other. So there are all these other extraneous variables that are impacting your, your, your outcome variable. And that's not a, a bad thing. It's just something to keep in mind when you're reading R. You say, oh, geez, that's a fairly small correlation. Yeah, but that's just because outcomes that we're interested in, behaviors, uh, thoughts, feelings, moods, psychological constructs are typically multiply determined, multiply influenced. So explaining just a little bit of variability can still be um, meaningful and, and exciting. Okay, so we've talked about so far, so far is all assumed for quantitative data that were on a ratio or interval scale. Right, to do a, a Pearson's uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, what if you have ordinal data? Like so if your data are, are, are rank ordered. Well, all the stuff we're talking about still applies. You just calculate a slightly different stat. You calculate Spearman's row instead of Pearson's R. But it's interpreted the same way, still ranges from negative one to one, still calculate R squared as the coefficient of determination, all this stuff, still the same. Okay, so what does it mean if we have a non-significant correlation? So R is non-significant, P is greater than alpha, right? So maybe we set alpha at 0.05 and we get P of you know, 0.07 or 0.10. Oh, it's not statistically significant. So there's not a statistically significant relationship, but, but we know there's a relationship. We know it's there. Why might we not find statistical significance when looking at um, a Pearson correlation coefficient? Well, one of the biggest reasons is you might be looking at something that's a non-linear relationship because Pearson correlation coefficients and even uh, Spearman's row pretty much look at linear relationships. Right? We're looking at, okay, as if you increase on one, are you going to have uh, continuing increases or continuing decreases on the other and not any kind of change in direction? And we know some variables aren't related that way. One we want to talk about the most is the relationship between anxiety and performance, right? That uh, performance anxiety curve where at low levels of anxiety, you know, I'm not worried about the test. You do pretty poorly because you don't study very hard, right? But as anxiety increases, performance starts to get better, right? Which suggests for the uh, from low to moderate levels of anxiety, there is a positive correlation between anxiety and performance, right? But then there's this tipping point. After you get to moderate level of anxiety, you start getting more and more anxious. Now performance is going to turn and come back down. So from moderate to high levels of anxiety there is a negative correlation between anxiety and performance. Right? Just in overall, there's a curvilinear relationship between uh, anxiety and performance. And so if you calculate a Pearson's R for this data set, you'd get R equals zero, non-significant. There's no relationship. Um, so this just kind of points out the importance of looking at scatter plots, of visually uh, examining your data to see, okay, does there appear to be a linear trend? Does there appear to be a blob? Or does there appear to be some sort of nonlinear trend, right? A quadratic trend? If so, then there's other statistical procedures you can do or things you can do with your data um, before you uh, analyze it to look at those nonlinear relationships. Okay. So that's one instance why you might not find significance, but there still is something going on just because you're kind of using the wrong tool, right? Trying to hammer a nail with your, with your, um, your wrench. Uh, another problem is restriction of range. Right, because we're talking a lot about uh, with correlations, especially linear correlations, um, accounting for variability in one variable with variability in the other, which presumes we have variability in our measures. If we don't have variability, we can't find relationships based on uh, covariation, which is basically covariability. Right. Um, so if I'm looking at um, the relationship between um, uh, education 
and uh, reading fluency. And I get a bunch of people who are um, in college. And I say, okay, are you, you know, first year, second year, junior, senior? So I measure their level of education. And I measure their reading fluency. Will I find a correlation between those two things? Probably not, right? Because everybody's going to have pretty similar level of reading fluency at that level, right? They have different levels of education, but I've got a restricted range of education I'm looking at. And because I have a restricted range of education, I'm also going to have a restricted range of reading fluency. And so it's going to look like there's no relationship. But if I go back and I get, you know, um, pre-K all the way through college, okay, now I should see some, I get some variability, right? I have much more variability in education. I should also have variability in reading fluency, right? Hopefully college students have greater reading fluency than kindergartners, hypothetically. Um, and if that's the case, I'm much more likely to find a correlation there because I've got variability in both measures. Right? So, so one thing about it is, uh, in your sample, the, the, for the, the construct you're measuring, can you expect people to be different? Is there gonna be variability there? If there's not variability, if everybody's too similar on that measure, then you're not gonna find a correlation because there's nothing to predict with or predict to. So that's the problem when everybody's the same. A related problem uh, is, uh, or are, floor and ceiling effects. This is where everybody may not be the same, but everybody will look the same because of your measurement. Right? So if I get a, a, a bunch of uh, um, police officers and I want to look at um, the relationship between being exposed to dangerous situations and uh, likelihood of um, perceiving danger, right? I'm going to show images of, you know, a, a, a tool or a weapon and you've got to quickly identify if it's a tool or a weapon and they're going to flash super fast, right? The idea being that if you're primed for seeing more weapons, when you see tools, you'll mistakenly call them weapons, right? So uh, I've got that measure to say, okay, how many times, how many times are they going to misidentify a tool as a, a weapon? But I'm looking at, okay, how much danger have you been exposed to? And if my measure is um, so have you been exposed to danger uh, zero times uh, ever, one time, two times, or three or more times? Right. And if I've got a bunch of police officers that have been on the job for you know more than a year, well, if everybody puts three or more times, I'm going to have no variability, right? And there, there may be some variability there, variability there but I can't see it because there's too low a ceiling on my measure. I can't see... Oh, this person was going to say six. This person was going to say 70. I can't see those numbers because I stopped asking at three, right? And the floor is the opposite where uh, for whatever my measure is, I've got two, um, the people are, could, would score lower than the floor, but the floor is too high and I can't see how low they actually would score. And that can lead to this kind of restriction, restriction of range as well. So nonlinear relationships, restriction of range, and then as with any study, when you don't find the significant results, could be due to insufficient power, right? Which again, uh, insufficient power is often caused by uh, low, low end, so a small sample size, or insufficient variability, which goes back to restriction of range leading to insufficient power. And the other thing that can uh, give you too much uh, uh, error variance uh, is you have too much error in your measures. If you have really kind of um, poorly constructed measures that aren't accurately measuring your predictor or criterion variables, well then you're going to have too much noise in the data and you won't be able to see a relationship because again you have poor poor measurement, uh, um, poor reliability, poor construct validity. Okay, so what about uh, correlations between uh, qualitative variables or nominal variables? Well for this you're probably going to use a chi-square statistic, a chi-square test of independence. This is where you're uh, comparing observed frequencies to, uh, well, what frequencies would you expect if the null hypothesis were true, right? So you've got, uh, let's say, people who are um, have uh, either uh, secure attachment, uh, preoccupied attachment, uh, ambivalent attachment, or dismissing attachment style at birth, right? And we're saying, okay, is the relationship between attachment style at birth and adult attachment style using those same categories. Right? Okay, well obviously you can't just make those one, two, three, four because they're not, there's no ordinal 
ranking of those data. They're nominal, different categories. So what you do is, okay, well, if there were no relationship between these variables, then, okay, I've got these, uh, how many people I have being securely attached, then 25% of those will be secure later, 25% will be preoccupied, 25% will be dismissing, 25% will be ambivalent. Same thing with other categories. They would just be evenly distributed based on how they were um, at the beginning. So that's your expected frequencies. And then you have your actual observed frequencies, and you calculate the chi-square based on, okay, how different is observed from expected? And if observed and expected are different, then it suggests that, okay, maybe there is a relationship here. Because these things, um, the, the percentages aren't working out as they should if there were no relationship. So the chi-square value doesn't tell you anything. You know, you get a value, and you, you know if it's statistically significant or not, but um, it doesn't tell you things are more or less related because the chi-square value itself is, is heavily influenced by the size of your uh, in, the number of observations you have. So to interpret uh, the results of any kind of chi-square test of independence, you need to look at the contingency table where you have the you know variables along the bottom, variables along the side. You have, okay, the percentage of people who um, were here or are now here, were here or are now here. We have, okay, uh, of the people who were still attached uh, as infants, 80% are still securely attached as adults. Um, of those who were uh, dismissing, 70% are still dismissing as adults, whatever it is, right? So you look for those uh, patterns to make sense of the, the chi-square. You can also, if you have two dichotomous variables, right? Where with that uh, attachment, we talked about, you know, these four categories and those four categories. If we collapse those down to secure, insecure child, secure, insecure adult, Okay, well now we've made them dichotomous variables where each variable has two possible values. For that, I can actually calculate a correlation coefficient, a phi uh, coefficient, which is uh, interpreted just like the Pearson R in the Spearman row, right? Ranges from negative one to one, looks at the degree of association. Uh, and if I have maybe one dichotomous variable and one quantitative variable, and I've got another correlation for that, point by serial, which take a second here and think about this. So if I've got a dichotomous variable, and then a quantitative kind of continuous ratio interval type variable. You know, so you're secure or insecure, and I'm looking at, okay, um, as a child, now I've got a continuous measure of maybe um, how happy you are in your current relationship as an adult. I could calculate a point by serial correlation coefficient for that. Or what else can I do? Well, I could do an independent group's t-test, right? I can compare, okay, what's the average level of happiness for those who are secure? to the average level of happiness those who are insecure, right? And do a t-test for that. Which if you remember, uh, for a t-test, you can calculate an r squared value based on t, right? Uh, r squared is equal to t squared over t squared plus degrees of freedom squared, something like that. Don't hold me to that formula. But there's a formula for that. If you do the t for this, a data set, calculate an r squared, if you had done a point by serial, calculate uh, that r, square that r, it'll be the same r squared that you get from the t. So it's the same thing mathematically, just looked at slightly differently in terms of looking at degree of association versus uh, do these groups differ. Okay, along those lines, a lot of correlational research doesn't uh, rely on correlational coefficients, right? Pearson, r, Spearman rho, phi, they look at instead group differences. When we're looking at group differences, we use things like t-tests, right, independent groups t-tests, uh, dependent groups t-tests, uh, ANOVAs, uh, univariate, factorial, repeated measures, ano analysis of variance. The thing to keep in mind here is that the type of statistical test that uh, you use or that somebody uses in a paper doesn't dictate, doesn't tell you what type of research design they had. People often make that assumption they see an ANOVA, oh there's these group differences, oh so it's an experiment, right? Well, no, I mean, many experiments do use ANOVAs because most experiments do look at group differences. But just because you're looking at group differences doesn't mean it's experiment. If they didn't manipulate an IV, if they didn't randomly assign people to groups, if they're just looking on uh, group differences of existing groups, well, that's a correlational study. Okay, So correlational studies don't always use correlational coefficients to analyze the results. So in terms of interpreting the results from a correlational study, as you've heard a hundred times before, but you hear one more time today, you cannot infer causation from correlation, right? And the two reasons being, one, 
uh, directionality, right? We don't know if A and B are related, we don't know which way the direction all runs. So there could be reverse causation, where instead of A causing B, in fact, B causes A, right? So in the classic examples we often talk about uh, related to uh, aggression um, with kids, uh, does playing violent video games make kids aggressive? Maybe, but what if um, being aggressive makes kids want to play violent video games, right? Because it feels comfortable. You don't know which way it's going. Or could be reciprocal causation. So just so where it gets more complicated. It's not just, oh, is it A causes B or B causes A? Oh, it's both. Maybe it's both, right? Um, so anxiety and depression. Anxiety contributes to the experience of depression. Depression contributes to the experience of anxiety, right? That's, those are two kind of constructs that we uh, have a pretty good understanding uh, do have this kind of reciprocal interacting uh, uh, relationship. So when you find a correlation between those two measures, you don't know that one caused the other. Uh, so that's one reason you can't infer causation. The other being the third variable problem, also um, referred to uh, in your text as the common causal variable uh, problem. And this is where there's a relationship between A and B, but only because uh, of some third variable that explains that relationship, right? So, you know, if you were to find that uh, there is a strong correlation, a statistically significant correlation between uh, number of ashtrays uh, somebody owns and their uh, number of people in the household that have been diagnosed with cancer. Okay, well, clearly ashtrays cause cancer, right? Because, well, having cancer can't cause ashtrays. Well, don't know about reversibility there. Well, what's the problem? Well, it's this third variable, right? So smoking will cause you to have more ashtrays. Smoking in a household will cause everybody in that household to have higher rates of cancer, right? So there's this common cause of variable, some variable that's causing both the predictor and the criterion, and that's why they look like they're related. They're not actually related. They're just both being affected by some other variable. So you can infer causation from correlation, but Correlation is a clue for possible causation. Right? And so if you're interested in kind of causal relationships, but want to do correlation research looking at um, hypothetical causal relationships, you can kind of strengthen the cause for causation. So you have to address the two things, right? You have to address directionality, which could be just a matter of uh, logical impossibility. We say, okay, these two variables related, and this one can't logically um, cause... Um, uh, this other one. Right? So if there's a, a correlation between, you know, a, a parent's height and um, how well a child does in school, okay, well, it's a weird study, Dr. Fiala, I know, but so maybe for some reason having a taller parent makes kids do better in school. Well, could it be that doing better in school makes parents taller? No, like there's no biological mechanism by which that could happen. Right. So there's some, sometimes you can kind of rule out the uh, reverse causation argument when you're doing a, 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 even though you don't have correlation data, okay, but you rule out the reverse, ality, the reverse causation. If you can ru rule out the reciprocal causation, okay, now you've made a, a, a better case for causation because you've addressed that it's you know, logically impossible, at least improbable for that to be true. Uh, Design-wise, you can also do things to establish the temporal precedence of your two variables where your predictor uh, occurs before your criterion or outcome variable. And you can do this with uh, kind of developmental designs, uh, longitudinal, cross-sectional, cross-sequential. Longitudinal, where you're measuring, uh, you know, at, uh, kindergarten, follow up in second grade, follow up in fourth grade, follow up in sixth grade, right? So now, um, and I'm measuring my two variables in, uh, at those points in time, I can see how is it related uh, now How's it related here? How's it related here? And I can see when things change and I can deal with that, uh, which thing came first, you know, chicken or the egg kind of questions with a longitudinal study. Um, but there's some limitations uh, of longitudinal studies. You still can't deal with the, the, um, the third variable problem and they're super expensive to do. So sometimes people will opt for a cross-sectional study. So 
rather than following people across time all at once they'll say okay let's get data from uh, kindergartners second graders fourth graders and sixth graders all at once right and we'll compare okay these current sixth graders to these current fourth graders say and see if there's a difference between them then we can say and usually this is about um, the effects of age or time okay these kids are using social media more therefore um, Kids will use more social media uh, the older they get. Right? Um, what if you found the opposite, right? Where the you know the kindergartners are using so more social media than the sixth graders, and there's certainly a point in time somewhere that you would have found that, right? And you would have found that because of cohort effects, right? Where at some point in time there was a group of uh, kids where social media wasn't super common yet. And so these kids have gotten to sixth grade without it being too prevalent. And these kindergartners are coming on the scene right when it's hitting and they're getting access to it. So they may suddenly be using it more. Right? Um, so there's some problems with cross-sectional studies too because you have these cohort effects uh, where things can happen differently to people at different points in time. Uh, what we want to do with that is to do a cross-sequential design. And this is basically a mishmash of a cross-sectional and longitudinal design put together where you get that K, second, fourth, sixth, you get those people all at once and then you follow them every two years that way you can kind of parse out all those uh, cohort effects and the, the time effects and then you can start making some more arguments uh, um, about causation because you're accounting for um, this directionality factor because you're establishing which thing happened first and when things changed but even when you do all that you still haven't addressed the third variable problem most of the time Right. This is when you're trying to control for those possible th third variables, those possible common causal variables. A couple ways to deal with this. One would be to um, partial out the variance. So uh, mathematically pretend people are the same on some variable. Right. That's when they say that they, uh, they're statistically controlling for blah, blah, blah. So if we're looking at, okay, uh, people's... Um, uh, academic achievement in college. We're trying to predict with a variety of variables and let's say we uh, they controlled for socioeconomic status. So after controlling for socioeconomic status, um, the best predictor of uh, academic achievement was you know number of books in the home. Okay, so what do you mean when controlling for SES? Well, they look at the relationship between SES and academic achievement and then they based on how related those two things are, they adjust everybody's numbers up or down on um, the outcome variable based on that relationship. So they treat people, treat people as if they have the same SES. Do those people really have the same SES? Well, no. And might SES be related to number of books that were in the home? Well, yeah. So it's helpful but it's sometimes misleading i think when people say that they're controlling for these variables because they're not they're manipulating the numbers to say okay well what if people had the same score what would this what would the relationship be with some other variables but they didn't really have the same score so it's not a perfect way to do it uh i think arguably a better way is just to, to measure measure kind of this third variable uh you know i think this is like this other people might say it's because of this well i'm going to measure that third variable to see if it mattered and I'm going to hope that it didn't, right? Or at least that my variable mattered more, was more predictive. So I'm not controlling for it. I just, just want to show, oh, no, uh, people might say it's because of, uh, you know, a number of siblings in the home. But I measured that, and it wasn't a significant, uh, wasn't significantly correlated. Therefore, that's not an explanation. Now I've given more evidence that my thing is the cause. Right? A third way to do it would be to um, measure on the kind of third variable before you do the study for inclusion exclusion criteria and select participants that are homogenous that are all the same on some third variable right so like if you think if you say okay well i want to control for ses then you do the study with people that all have the same ses okay so now whatever differences you find on the outcome can't be due to differences in ses because they're all the same on that obvious obvious drawback would be You've now limited your external validity to only apply to people from that level of SES that you selected for, but at least you've actually controlled for that variable for this group of people. But now again, your findings are limited to that group, and now you got to go back and do the study again with some, but with a group of people of a different SES.
Okay, um, moving beyond uh, correlational study or correlational coefficients, when you want to do slightly more complex analyses within correlational research, you typically use multiple regression. And a couple of things we've talked about in terms of controlling four variables, that's often done within multiple regression. You can also do it in ANOVA uh, with uh, analysis of covariance. Uh, very similar mathematically to multiple regression. But basically with multiple regression, you're looking at the relationship between multiple predictors and a single criterion. Whereas correlations are always uh, bivariate. This one and this one, A and B, B and C, C and D, two at a time. Regression is all these things at once with this with one outcome. Right. So with multiple regression, you're able to examine the relative contributions of a group of predictors. Uh, how related are these predictors considering how related other predictors are as well? Okay. So if that doesn't make sense, maybe this will help. So in trying to predict why some outcomes, some criterion, let's say I can account for 30%, 40% of the variability in Y if I know X sub 1, X sub 2, and X sub 3. So if I've got you know these three measures, you know, I've got your high school GPA, I've got your SAT score, and I've got the number of uh, extra extracurricular activities you are in. Okay, I can now predict your uh, college GPA um, fairly well. I can explain 40% of the variability. With regression, I can look at all those pictures. I can now add in one more. Well, if I also know your mom's college GPA, I put that into the equation, x sub 4. Does that explain any additional variability? Can I understand, can I predict your college GPA better, right? And that's what regression can do. It can look at um, if adding or taking away variables from an equation will explain more or less of the variability in an outcome. So if you put a whole bunch of variables in, um, you get to see their relative contributions. And that can be helpful in terms of eliminating uh, possible third variables. Okay, here's this. this uh, people said this might be a common causal variable. Look, I showed it's not. Um, and it can also account for possible extraneous uh, variables. Extraneous variables being things that are related to your uh, outcome, but not your predictor. You can just say, okay, I think uh, these two things are super important. That's what I'm interested in, in predicting achievement. Uh, this other thing might be related too. Yep, and it is important. But even when, even when considering that other extraneous variable, I can still explain some variability with the things I'm interested in. Right. Um, so in calculating multiple regression, you get uh, R instead of lowercase r, and you get capital R squared instead of lowercase r squared. Interpreted the same way in terms of uh, coefficient determination. Its statistical significance is tested with the F test, which is uh, the same uh, stat test used for uh, analysis of variance. Again, they're mathematically very similar. Uh, and you also get uh, standardized beta coefficients, which are also referred to generically as, generically as regression coefficients for each predictor. Those are tested to be whether they're statistically significant or not with uh, uh, t-test. Now these, these beta coefficients, whenever you're reading about these in studies, uh, they're important, right? Because it's telling you which predictor uh, is doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of predicting some outcome. So if I've got uh, you know four variables I put into an equation to predict some outcome, and one of them has a higher beta weight than the other, then when using all four of those predictors, the one with the highest beta weight is the best predictor. Does that mean, okay, if I can only use one of these four, which one do I want to use to predict with? No, not necessarily, right? Because regression is a little complicated in terms of it. It's looking at the relation between that predictor and the outcome in the context of the relations of the other predictors and that outcome. So if you only have one thing to use, well, then you want the predictor that has the best zero order correlation. So that's when you're going back to what we talked about before, those uh, just a Pearson correlation coefficient, this variable, and this variable, which one had the highest R? Well, okay, so there, it's also gonna have the highest R squared. If I can only get one, well, then that's the one I want. And the one that has the highest bivariate zero order correlation won't necessarily have the highest beta weight. Well, that's an important thing to uh, keep in mind when, when reading studies. Oh, this is the best predictor. Well, it's the best predictor when looking at all those things. Does that mean it's the best predictor to use if you can only use one? Nope. Okay.
um, mediation and moderation something else you can you, you can look at with uh, multiple regression in terms of um, correlational studies mediation is when there's a relation between a and c but only because a is related to b and b is related to c and usually in kind of a causal direction so a, and there's this relationship we're seeing uh, a causes b uh, and b uh, causes c so in regression you can identify mediation because when you add the mediator to the the model or the equation so you when you add in uh, b it reduces the beta weight for the predictor a so you put it in a and c by themselves a has this big old beta weight you add b in and now the beta weight for a uh, becomes non-significant or at least becomes smaller okay that's evidence that b is playing a, a mediatory role so again one thing causes one which causes the other which is different from moderation and moderation there's a relationship between a and c but only for some levels of b right so if you're high on b then it's a and c are related but if you're low on b well a and c aren't related at all or maybe they're related in the opposite direction right? so in this case a is not causing b b is not causing c but that relationship depends on the level of b and again that's something you can look at in regression uh, where you uh, you separate the data depending on their score on the moderator so if they're high or low on the moderator or um, uh, low medium high and you do that if the interaction term which is a times b is a significant predictor of c which um, of course you do by you standardize your variables into to z scores and then you, just, you literally just multiply the values of whatever the value is of that uh, a variable multiply it by the value of your suspected moderator creates a, a, a you know a product and that's a new variable it's your interaction term you put that in uh, as, a, as if it were another variable if it's significant predictor of your outcome well then you may have moderation and now you can split the data up and say okay is the relation between a and c different depending on people who are high versus low on the suspected moderator okay uh, last thing when to use correlational designs well you can use it when you're interested in causation but you know you can't do an experiment because if you're interested in causation you should do an experiment absolutely but sometimes you can't because you can't manipulate the independent variable, right? Uh, either because of practicality or ethics. You know, they won't let you do certain things to people uh, anymore. Um, so you just uh, ask people about their experiences rather than making them experience uh, certain things. Similarly, often we can't uh, randomly assign people to levels of the independent variable, right? We can't assign them to, to a group, which we need to be able to do that. We need to have that power for it to be a true experiment. And if we can't, then we're looking at possibly a correlational design. Or it could be that, you know, we're interested in the effect of the independent variable on some dependent variable at multiple levels of the IV, right? Because if you do an experiment, typically, you know, if I'm going to do um, a, a study looking at group differences, let's say I'll do, uh, you know, placebo versus drug. Okay, well, what about placebo versus 10 milligrams versus 30 milligrams? Okay. If I want to know, well, what about 5 milligrams, 15, 25? The more groups I start doing, the bigger my sample size has to be because I have to have a certain number of people in each group. And so it becomes untenable. It becomes, uh, um, you're unable to do it. You're unable to, to do a study, have sufficient power if you want to do groups at all different levels. But when I do a correlation study, I don't have people at all different levels. I just measure where you at, right? Some people say it might be, uh, might be taken five, some people might think 10, some people 15, 25, 30. And it doesn't matter how many I have at each level because I'm looking at this linear relationship, not necessarily group differences. And so if you're interested in that and you're interested, okay, well, what if there's this dose response curve where, uh, yep, uh, more of the drug is good, but at some point it gets bad. It's easier to see, easier to identify with a correlational study than just trying to uh, grab different groups till you find the one that's you know, where the the, the breakpoint is uh, or you might just not be interested in causation right there's sometimes where researchers just want to be able to predict an outcome right so what's gonna how who's gonna be the best job applicant who's gonna be the most successful student um, who's gonna be the most responsible parent right so if there's decisions we need to make we want to make data-based decisions 
sometimes uh, we or people don't care what the causal relationship is. They just want to be able to accurately make the best decision, right? So we're trying to predict, okay, who's gonna, uh, which parents, uh, when parents have uh, custody disputes, okay, in which cases does it work out the best for the kid? When what, what variables are present, right? And you may not care why. If you're a judge, if you're a scientist, of course you always care why. But if you're just there to make the decision and trying to make the best outcome, then correlational research is fine. You're just looking for what's the best predictor. Of course, some decisions that becomes problematic, right? Uh, in terms of uh, when people rely on data that way and don't understand the underlying mechanisms, it can lead to discrimination, right? So if you're looking at um, you know, placement decisions for um, child custody cases. You know, you could probably run some correlation analyses and find a, a statistically similar correlation showing that, okay, when you place with the mother, uh, you have more often have a, uh, a better outcome than with the father. And again, not always true, but it'll be true enough that you find a st statistically similar correlation. So if you use that to then justify, okay, then no matter the situation, based on the uh, biological gender of the parent, that's how we're gonna decide where a kid goes. And that's problematic, right? So, uh, but again, if you just care about outcome, you don't care about why, correlation search will be fine. More often, it's that you're not in causation yet. Like, ultimately I am, but not just yet. First, maybe I want to identify the, the, the likely suspects, right? So what are the possible things that are causing this outcome, right? Rather than doing... Because when I do an experiment, again, typically I have groups. I need a certain number of people per group to have sufficient power. And it's expensive and time consuming. So, okay, is it uh, this one? Okay, do another study. Is it this one? Do this, another study. Is it this one? Whereas with a correlation study, I can measure a bunch of variables um, simultaneously with much fewer subjects, less expense to identify which one is a good predictor, right? Because if there is a causal relationship, then there should be a correlation, right? So correlation doesn't mean causation, but causation does usually cause there to be a correlation present. Uh, or similarly, I'm not in causation just yet, but I want to identify possible uh, mediation or moderation effects. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that these thing, the thing A causes B, but I'm not sure if it's true for all groups. So maybe I'll do a correlation study first Find that okay. Oh no! In the in my question study, it only it worked for this group, but not this group. So now that's going to influence the design of my experimental study, um, where I will probably then have equal number of people of those two groups. If I have a moderating variable, if it's men and women, I'm going to make sure I have you know equal numbers of both, so I can look at that difference um, statistically. Okay, wrap it up. Uh, correlational research involves much, much more than just a Pearson R correlation coefficient, right? Correlational research is a design method. It's a way, it's where you are measuring variables and looking at relationships between those variables. And you can do that with Pearson R, but you also use a variety of other statistical tests as well. Don't expect huge correlations in behavioral sciences, right? When you're conducting research or when you're reading things, because again, there are all these extraneous variables, other things that are influencing the outcomes we're interested in. Right? And that's not because it's, you know, people aren't doing uh, good science. It's because we're studying incredibly complex events that are multiply determined and we don't typically study things in isolation, right? Whereas in uh, some of the other sciences, you know, we're going to spin this particle around and smash another particle in a super controlled setting to figure out these things and it's very precise, very controlled. Well, is that true if that happens over here? I don't know, it happened in this collider here at this one place in Switzerland, right? We can't afford to do that necessarily in payroll science. We tend to be much more uh, broad with our lens. So we're typically looking at um, smaller uh, correlation coefficients to identify interesting um, relationships among and between variables. Uh, and then again, you can't infer causation from correlation, but it's a maybe, and there again, there are steps you can take to increase your case that there is a causal relationship. Uh, and when people apply things like uh, path analysis, structural equation modeling, that helps uh, because whenever you're doing those things, trying to account for those third variables, uh, deal with directionality, those more sophisticated statistical techniques 
are helpful at dealing with um, multiple um, multiple variables and multiple relationships among variables simultaneously. But as much as you can increase your confidence in causality, it's only up to a point. You still cannot infer causation from correlation no matter how fancy your stats, no matter how big your sample size. The design of the study will limit the degree to which you have internal validity, the degree to which you can confidently deduce causal relationships. You can only do that if you do an experimental design. If you have a correlation design, even if it's a really good one, you've eliminated all these other possibilities, you've increased the likelihood of causation, but it's still not to the level that you would get with an experimental design. Okay, that's all for now. Take care.